Well, as we gather together this Lord's Day to give praise and worship to the one true and living God, whether you join with us here in person or whether you are joining with us online, we extend to you a special word of welcome. And we trust as we meet in this place today, the Lord God of the heavens and the Lord God of the earth will meet with us. He will lead us, he will guide us, and he will bring glory to his great name. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Eternal Father, in your providence, in your grace, and in your mercy, you have summoned us and you have brought us to this house of prayer that together as a people we might do that for which you created us that we this day might bring glory to your name. But Father, the more often we gather and seek to do so, we understand we will fail to glorify you and worship you as we ought. Unless you grant us the aid and the assistance of your Holy Spirit, so we look to you and pray you would look down upon us and by your Spirit you would enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth. For it's in the Saviour's name we pray. Amen. We continue now to worship our God as we sing to his praise and to his glory, the hymn number 215, the hymn number 215, and we remain seated as we sing, Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it. As we seek his face in prayer, let us all pray. Eternal Father, the nation of which we are a part, yesterday remembered Her Majesty the Queen's birthday. And we realize our Father to do so. Many soldiers made their way to London 
and presented them to presented themselves to Her Majesty, the Queen. And they did so, our Father, seeking to honor our monarch. They did so, our Father, seeking to thank her for her many years of service. And so it is, our Father, we gather in this house today in many respects, to do the very same, to worship you, the Lord, our God, to seek to honor you, the Lord God, to seek to respect you, the Lord God, and to thank you, our Father, for your goodness and your, for your faithfulness to us, your subjects, those who by your grace you have called into your service. We remember to our Father how long our monarch has reigned. The longest reigning monarch so far as we know in the history of our nation. And one of the longest reigning monarchs on the face of this earth. And yet our God, as we come to you, we realize without doubt and without question, you're the one who has reigned longer than any other king and than any other queen. You knew no beginning and you shall know no ending because you are the one whose throne is eternal. And even as we pay homage to our queen for her long reign, today we come and pay homage to you the one who has reigned forever, whose rule spans not just a number of nations, but whose rule spans our world, our galaxy, and the universe. What an honor it is today to gather in this place, to unite our hearts, our minds, and our souls in the worship of your great name. Receive our worship, we pray, for we bring it in the name of your Son, our Savior, who even now is seated at your right hand. And through whom, even as we confess our sin, we surely find the forgiveness of such sin. Hear our prayer, we pray. Receive our praise and forgive us for all of our sins. For it's in the Savior's name we ask it. Amen. We turn once again this morning to the book of the Judges, to Judges chapter 8 and verses 4 to 17. Judges chapter 8 and verses 4 to 17. And the title of our sermon today is Unexpected Resistance. Unexpected Resistance. Judges chapter 8 and verses 4 to 17. Let us hear the word of God. And Gideon came to the Jordan and crossed over. He and the 300 men who were with him, exhausted yet pursuing. So he said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. And the officials of Succoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hand that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, Well then, 
When the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, I will flail your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And from there he went up to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. And he said to the men of Penuel, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Now Zeba and Salmuna were in Karkor with their army, about 15,000 men, all who were left of all the army of the people of the east. For there had fallen 120,000 men who drew the sword. And Gideon went up by the way of the tent dwellers east of Nuba and Jogbeha and attacked the army, for the army felt secure. And Zeba and Zalmunna fled, and he pursued them and captured the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and he threw all the army into a panic. Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle by the ascent of Heres, and he captured a young man of Succoth and questioned him, and he wrote down for him the officials and elders of Succoth, seventy-seven men. And he came to the men of Succoth and said, Behold Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you taunted me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hand, that we should give bread to your men who are exhausted? And he took the elders of the city, and he took thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them taught the men of Succoth a lesson. And he broke down the power of tower of Penuel and killed the men off the city. And we close there in verse 17. And we trust the living God will bless this reading from his word. Now, boys and girls, as you know, last Sunday was our children's day. And I was sitting out the back. We weren't able to get in here because there were so many people and we were watching Children's Day on the television screen out there. But anyway, last Monday or the following Monday morning, I was out walking the dog and thinking about Children's Day and thinking about what had been said. And it was about a quarter past six in the morning and we were walking along the Tullygarley River path and in the river, there were about nine little tiny birds following their mother up the river just in front of Puma, my dog, and myself. Could any of you guess what those tiny little birds were? They could all swim just like their mom and just like their... Anybody think what they were? There's about nine of them. That's right, they were ducks. They were little ducklings. So as we walked along the river, we saw little ducklings. And then we, we continued along the river on up through Grange Avenue or one of those avenues going into Ballymena, onto the old Galgorm Road, then back down to Galgorm and into where the golf club is in Galgorm. And there, as I walked Puma, he spotted a little fluffy thing that was on the grass, that was eating the grass, that was enjoying the grass, a little fluffy thing with a little tiny white tail that we only were able to see when the little thing spotted Puma and began to run away. Run away. Could any of you tell me what that little cuddly fluffy thing was? Same color as the little ducklings, but not very good at swimming, I don't think. Like the darkness. I don't think what that was. It was a wee bunny rabbit. And then we weren't more than another hundred yards walking along up towards the back of County Hall, and there Puma and I spotted not that far away, and I could hardly hold him. I could hardly contain him because there was a fox, and the fox saw Puma. And I saw the fox and pure, and the fox took off running because it knew if Puma got off the lead, there would be trouble. But it was a very 
what I would say, dull colored fox. You know the way foxes are quite often bright orange, almost red. So I reckon that was probably the vixen, the mother fox, who was out on the golf course trying to catch one of those little bunnies to bring it back to the den to feed her little cubs. So the, the bunny, when it saw Puma coming, had ran away into the grass, probably into its burrow, probably into its hole. And then the fox, when it saw Puma coming, it scarpered away off into the trees probably back to the den, to the safety of the den. I, I was thinking about that as I walked along and thought about something that Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 and verse 58, where we read, Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man, and Jesus is speaking about himself, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You see, from the time that Jesus was born into this world to the time that our Lord Jesus died, apart from a number of years as he was brought up as a little boy, as a little child. He had no real home, no place of safety to run and to hide. You will remember, won't you, he wasn't even born at home. He was born in a stable. And as a little boy, he, he wasn't in the early years even brought up in his homeland, never mind in his home. He had to go to Egypt to escape the Herod. And that's why Jesus said, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man that is me. I have nowhere to lay my head. Boys and girls, doesn't that simple, yet very meaningful truth remind us about something so, so important? Doesn't it remind us of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. To save us from our sin. Not only when he walked this earth, not only did most of the time he have nowhere to lay his head, but to save us from our sin, he came from the heights and from the glory. An amazing and a wonderful place to come into this world to save sinners like you and like me. And your hymn today, number 360, and I know we sang this hymn last week at our Children's Day, but it, but it is surely so, so profound when we think on the fact that Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. Number 360, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus. What a wonderful friend is he. For he left all the glory of heaven, came to earth to die on Calvary.
Well, by way of announcements, we would ask you to remain seated at the end of the service before the stewards usher you to their respective exits. Wednesday night, our midweek meeting online at 8 o'clock, and the title of our study this week will be in relation to Job chapter 42, Tying Up Some Loose Ends. The next Lord's Day, our service of worship at 11.30 a.m., and we continue our studies in the book of the Judges. Then we have some announcements in relation to the vacancy here in the Cunningham. First of all, in relation to the Kirk Session, there will be a meeting of Kirk Session on the following dates. That is this Tuesday, the 15th of June, then on Monday, the 21st of June, then on Tuesday, the 22nd of June, then on Thursday, the 24th of June. Members of session should have received the details of these meetings, and if not, you're asked to get in contact with our convener, the Reverend Albert Baxter, or with our clerk of session, Mr. Leonard Wiseman. And then there's a further announcement that, announcement that we have to make in relation to the vacancy, and it is as follows. In connection with the potential election of a minister, a voter's list has been prepared and will be displayed in the vestibule of the meeting house on each of the next two Sundays. Voting members in the church are communicants on the role of the congregation who are listed, whether by name or number, as having contributed to the stipend or weekly free will offering of the congregation in the last financial year. In addition to those so listed, the following shall also be qualified if themselves communicants on the rule. First of all, a wife shall be qualified on a husband's contribution and vice versa, where both are communicants. This shall also apply should the contributor himself or herself not be a communicant. If neither husband nor wife in such circumstances is a communicant, then their contribution shall qualify the eldest child residing in the family who is on the communicant's rule. And then also, should a contributor who is not a communicant be a member of a family residing together, then his contribution shall qualify the eldest member residing in the family who is on the communicant's rule. And should any member of the congregation who claims to be a voting member desire to make an objection regarding any name on the list, or omitted from the list, they shall lodge their objections with their reasons in writing with the moderator of Kirk Session, that is, with the Reverend Albert Baxter, within a week of the first publication of the list. And this announcement has been pinned on the notice board out there in the Cunningham Suite. These then are all our announcements so let us now bring to the Lord our prayers of intercession. Let us all pray. Our gracious God, as we made our way to this house of prayer, we saw the sunshine, we felt its heat, and we were thankful, our Father, for the fact that you today have given us the health and the strength to leave our home to come to this place and to sing your praise. But as we gather here so thankful for this, we realize there are many members of our congregation who are not able to meet with us in person today because they're laid aside in illness, and some of them in serious illness. We remember them we think on their faces. We think on their names. And we bring them before you right now. And we pray in their weakness, in their pain, and in their trial. They would know your presence. And they would know your peace. We pray for them, our Father, and we pray for their families as they would seek to encourage, as they would seek to help. Be with them also 
and grant them health and strength and grace for these days of trial. We come to you as a people to remember our land, to remember our nation, and to pray for those who rule over us, especially our monarch queen, Elizabeth. We pray for her as she still comes to terms with the loss of her dear husband. May she know your strength, your wisdom, and your guidance in these days of difficulty. We pray too for your word and for the preaching of that word, asking that as your word is read and as your word is preached, you would preach, you would speak through that word. For it's in the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Unexpected resistance. I would guess those of us gathered here in the Cunningham today or listening online, we have all what we would call our pet hates. Maybe if we are drivers and we are behind the wheel of our car, we really do not like those people who tailgate us, who drive right up the back of our car. Or maybe we don't like those people who are slow drivers, we head out to go somewhere uh, and we get behind a car that is so, so slow and there was no way that we can take them over safely. Or maybe we hate cocky drivers, those who are so confident, those who at times are ignorant when we meet them on the road. Maybe that's a pet hate of ours. Or maybe on the other hand, we are the type of person who seriously struggles with those who start to do something but never finish the job. When we're at home, if we start maybe to wash the windows, we want to finish washing those windows we don't want to be interrupted. Or maybe we're out washing the car. And when we're washing the car, we want to finish washing that car. And again, we don't want anybody to interrupt us and to stop us. Well, as we continue our studies in Judges chapter 8, we discover that while a great victory had been won, there was still an awful lot of work to do. The job, if you like, was not quite finished. The 300 soldiers championed by getting were victorious in battle. The men of Ephraim had successfully dealt with many of the enemy who had fled, putting to death two of their princes. But there are still two Midianite kings on the loose. And Gideon knows if these two kings are not dealt with, if these two kings are not taken out, these two kings will live to fight another day. Let us look then at these next verses and see what happens? Well, first of all, we see on the part of Gideon and the 300, a determination, a determination to finish the job. What do we read in chapter 8 and verse 4? And Gideon came to the Jordan and crossed over. He and the 300 men who were with him exhausted, yet pursuing. Exhausted, yet pursuing. You will remember in a previous chapter, chapter 7, God set a trial 
a test to thin down the 32,000 who had volunteered to fight, to thin them down to the 300. And one of the tests that was set was to bring these soldiers down by the water and, and to understand, to find out what they were made of. Whether they would be the type of soldiers who would be able to keep on going regardless or whether they would be the type of soldiers who would always be needing sustenance, who would always be needing drink and water and whatever else to keep them going. God knew, you see, what Gideon needed for the future. Those who would not only go the extra mile, but those who would keep going mile after mile after mile, so long as there was still work in the land to be done. That was the caliber of a soldier that God knew that Gideon needed. And now as we get into chapter 8, we see the absolute necessity for such soldier. The scripture tells us in black and white language, not surprisingly, that the 300 soldiers who are defeated on the field of battle, the might of Midian, the scripture tells us they are exhausted. Had Gideon led the original 32,000 into battle. 31,700 of them would now have been dead on their feet. They would have given up, and the two kings would probably have lived to raise another army and to fight another day. Yes, there would still have been 300 committed warriors but their advance would surely have been hampered by the 31,700 who were judged not to be fit for the task. God knew what would be required for the mopping up operation, and so we read, yes, these soldiers were exhausted, but nevertheless, they kept up pursuing Nothing would stop them, not even exhaustion pursuing the enemy. I wonder as the God of heaven looks on us, does he see the type of fortitude, the type of commitment, the like of which we see here in Gideon and his three hundred in the home, in the place of work, are we those who give ourselves? Or in truth, are we those who do as little as we can possibly do? But not only in the work at home or the office or wherever, but surely most especially in the visible church of Jesus Christ, do we as individuals, do we as a congregation, do we as people, do those of you who are listening on, do those of you who are watching on, do we know what it is to give ourselves to the work of the kingdom at times? Because we have given ourselves to the work of the kingdom, at times to be exhausted and yet to keep going. I wonder, has the lockdown really annoyed us? I mean really, really annoyed us and really, really troubled us because it has prevented us serving the Lord in so many ways. Or in truth, are there some 
who do not really want it to end. Gideon and the 300 are 100 percent determined to finish the job despite the fact that they are exhausted, despite the fact we would say today they're almost dead on their feet. Nevertheless, they will not stop until the work is finished, until the job is done. But then secondly, and it must be said tragically, not all those belonging to Israel were on message. Not all those belonging to Israel were on message. Because Gideon finds resistance to the court where he least expected it. What do we read in verse 5 of chapter 8? So he said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people, that is to the 300 who are following me, for they are exhausted. As brothers in the faith, and brothers in arms, Gideon had good reason to expect that seeing the exhaustion of his troops brought on no doubt and no small measure because of hunger. No doubt he had reason to expect that the men of Sokoth would be only too willing to feed those troops because those troops were putting their lives on the line not just for themselves but for the men of Sokoth, for their brothers and sisters within Israel. Gideon has good reason, therefore, to expect that they will come to the aid, that they will come to the assistance of his exhausted soldier. But in the event, what happens? Gideon is bitterly let down and bitterly disappointed because what do we read in verse 6 of chapter 8? And the officials of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Salmuna already in your hand that we should give bread to your army? They are called upon to help. They are called upon to feed these troops who were giving their everything, who were giving their all, and who were ready and willing to die for Israel and for the glory of God. Gideon and his 300 are not supermen. They are flesh and blood like we are flesh and blood. And they needed sustenance. But the men of Succoth are so self-centered and so selfish that they will not give them any of their bread. Gideon is not a happy man. For he knows his 300 have given themselves. And he lets the men of Succoth know that this is not over. He lets them know that they will answer, that they will pay. But the army or the enemy is still in the wind and needs to be pursued. And the 300, though beyond exhaustion, keep going. And Gideon then makes his way to the men of Penuel to see, will they help Will they give food to the 300? But again, they will not help. They refuse to share that which God had given them with the soldiers of Gideon. Perhaps some years later, it is hard for us to imagine the disappointment and the hurt such responses must have caused to Gideon. And the 300 brave but exhausted warrior. They have crossed the Jordan. They have left their homeland. They have left the Holy Land. And they're increasingly exposed 
putting their lives on the line. They would have expected trouble from Midian. They would have expected trouble from the Amalekites. They would have expected trouble from the retreating soldiers of the men of the east. That would have been expected. But not for a minute. They expecting resistance from their own brothers and sisters in the Lord. And you know, some over the years have sought to excuse the actions of the men of Succoth and Penuel. Because they lived on the wrong side of the Jordan, if we could put it like that. And if these two kings were not taken out, then they would wreak fury and vengeance upon the men of Succoth and Penuel and their wives and their families. And over the years, people have sought to excuse their refusal to feed Gideon's soldiers. And we may understand why, but we must not excuse what they did, because no excuse is given in the Scriptures. Their brothers are in great need, but what do they care about? Only their own security. Only their own welfare. Only their own safety. Don't you see it? Their safety is more important to them than the present and than the future. Possession of Israel. I may be wrong, but it seems to me in the church of Jesus Christ today, especially in relation to COVID-19, in some circles, it appears that safety has become more important than the work of the gospel. And the work of the kingdom and the public worship of the one true and living God. A determination to finish the job. Gideon meets resistance for release expect him. And then finally, in conclusion, there's a terrible irony in this passage, is or not. Succoth and Penuel, through their lack of will, through their inaction, may have avoided in future the wrath of Midian, and the wrath of the Amalekites, and the wrath of the peoples of the East. But through such, what did they do? They brought upon themselves the wrath of Gideon. Verses 16 and 17 of chapter 8. And he took the elders. Gideon has now returned to these two cities. He took the elders of the city and he took thorns from the wilderness and briars and with them taught the men of Succoth a lesson. And he broke down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. If you as yet are not converted. If you as yet are not saved, you need to understand as a result in this life, you may avoid in this world being mocked, being laughed at, and being ridiculed. 
and understand this. Just as the men of Succoth and Penuel, just as they sought to avoid trouble in their day, they brought trouble to themselves not long after. They had to face Gideon, the judge of Israel. So it is today in this world. If we avoid being mocked at and laughed at, because we will not come to Christ. Nevertheless, one day you must meet your Maker and you must meet your God. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we bow before you and your truth hits us where it hurts at times. It leaves us feeling exposed. It drives us, our Father, to bow our heads and to humble ourselves before you. Help us, our God, to take heed to that word. Help us, our Father, to listen and put it into practice in our hearts, in our minds, in our service, and in our lives. For it's in the Savior's name we pray. Amen. We close as we sing the hymn 567, 567, a, a stirring hymn of challenge. Rise up, O church of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of kings. and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen.